What is the resiliency of raising quail for my homestead? Zach from My Shire Farm is gonna answer that question today. We like to use the word resiliency here. I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of like self-sufficiency because even in the homesteading community, like you have to build a community that has different resources and different tools and, sure. and stuff like that. So as far as the resiliency of the quail and sustainability of them, once you get a, a, a set of them, is it pretty easy to, to have generational um, continuance of, of the birds? Oh yeah, absolutely. So you can, you know, like I said, once they hatch, they start laying eggs in about six weeks. Uh, the males are already active. They're ready to go. So you can start incubating the eggs right away. Okay. Um, the hens will lay for about two years. You'll have to switch your males out a little bit sooner than that. Uh, but when you replace, you can put, you know, the, the ones that you hatch out, just replace your old ones. Um, we recommend you do that for about three years before you bring in new blood. But there's many different things with that. So like if you have a couple different cages, you can easily just swap out every year, uh, you know, the males from one cage and the hens from the other and, and kind of mix that up. So you could easily do that and never bring in new blood. Okay. Um, and then we've had, I've had at least four people in the past couple of months tell me that they're on like generation 20 wow. and they still have not had any issues with inbreeding at all. Okay. Uh, so I, I would not recommend that. Uh, but you can go quite a while without having to, to try to freshen anything up. Something else that, you know, as far as the resiliency and sustainability goes, as far as like feed availability and conversion, how, like they're a small bird and they're a small egg. I'm mm -hmm. sure you need a lot of them to make up like the same size as a chicken. Something I learned about as a homesteader that I, I wasn't really even aware of is there's that whole like feed conversion chart when it comes to different, you know, animals. How, how do they fall? on that conversion chart and like, what's the, um, the return on investment, I guess, if you're going to put the feed into them versus what you're getting out of them, how's that work out? Uh, well, the conversion, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but I do know that the conversion rate was better than chickens, Okay. but I don't remember the exact statistics on that. It does. So I've done some, some quail math videos okay. uh, on our YouTube channel and pretty much an average, now it depends on where you're located, what your feed cost is, what your setup is, all that. But it's about nine cents an egg. Uh, now the eggs are a little bit healthier as far as nutrients go, um, but they are, it, it takes about three quail eggs to equal one chicken egg. But again, you can have a whole lot more quail and, and a lot less space than you than you can a chicken too. Okay. Uh, so that, goes, that plays a, a part into it too. And they eat anything that a chicken would. Uh, okay. You know, when we started, we were giving them like the chicks, like a turkey starter, just a broiler starter, okay. uh, and then just a, a all purpose layer feed. We did that for years and years and years. That's like a crumble, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've tried to pellet. It's just a little too big. Uh, and the mesh, I think, I think the, the best practice would be a crumble. You could get away with either one, uh, but the crumble seems to be... You buy it, you feed them, and you don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to worry about getting a specific, like a like a specific blend or game bird blend or something like that. You can get away with using just the traditional chicken feed from the feed store. Yeah, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Okay. Uh, now, because we made it into a business, we wanted to make sure that we were doing everything with best practices. We do some things that I don't necessarily recommend other people do because we're. You know, we're paying more for feed than what we would recommend you. Right. Uh, but that's just because we want to make sure that the stock is good and we're shipping out the right things and things like that. But we customize our layer feed just for egg production. Okay. Um, and then the the starter grower that you feed them for the first six to eight weeks, we just do a pheasant starter, a game bird starter. Okay. Uh, and it's nothing special. It's something that's in stock at our local store. When it comes to, I guess, so you receive your birds or you receive the, the eggs uh, from, from your company. And then if I have just a standard like incubator laying around, like one of those like styrofoam, you know, that tilts the eggs mm -hmm. at Farm Innovations, or there's another one that like turns it around in there. Do you need a special mm -hmm. incubator for quail or can they use the same like traditional setup as chicken? Nope. Same thing. Um, so obviously the eggs are a little bit smaller. Uh, so like the uh, farm innovator or the nurture 360, uh, which is the one that kind of rotates them or the little giant or whatever works all the same. Uh, they do sell like quail egg trays. Uh, but I've noticed that most people just use the chicken trays. And, uh, if the egg is just a little bit too small to fit in there, they put a little piece of paper towel underneath it to kind of spread it out. 
Uh, so most people don't even get the, the quail egg trays anymore. And our jumbo eggs actually fit chicken holders. And they're, they're year-long layers. Uh, they need artificial light. Um, but I mean, they'll lay all year for you. So they lay about 300 plus eggs a year. Okay. And you touched on light there. Do they, I guess that's another great question as far as, um, artificial light. Is there a special type of light they, they need, or can it just be like a, a traditional, like LED light? It can be anything. They're not picky at all. Okay. Um, we use LEDs in our barn, uh, but I know a ton of our customers that have a little hutch outside. Uh, and they just put a, a row of Christmas lights up and that works perfect. Okay. And that can come on for like certain for a number of hours a day type of thing or, or 24 seven? No, we don't recommend 24 seven. So the reason why you're adding light uh, mainly is for them to lay through the winter because the winter comes and it, you know, it's not as much daylight. So they stop laying then. So, you know, you're kind of tricking them into laying all year. Right. So if you're doing 24 hours, uh, 24 hours a day light, you're kind of shortening their lifespan. Okay. Um, and so you're not going to get as many eggs out of them. Uh, so we recommend 16 to 18 hours of light a day. And again, a lot of the, well, all of this information plus a lot more is in that Quail University course. They're very similar to chickens, but there are a couple little quirks that are different just yeah. because they are smaller uh, and things like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, that Quail University course, we spent a lot of time on. And uh, we really do. Th it's called Quail 101. Yeah. And it's literally eight hours of <laughs> information that you can watch, you know, as you go or before you get them or whatever. Uh, and it's yours to keep, too. So, I mean, you can always go back and, you know, when you start incubating, you can be like, I, I know I watched it, but right. now I don't remember. Uh, so, you know, you can just log on and, and watch it again and go, yep, that's right. So, like, the, the incubation process is different. They hatch within 18 days where chickens are... I don't remember, like 20, 20 something. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really do chickens anymore. In 21 days, something like that. Just a little bit longer yeah. than that. Yeah. yeah. So again, not, not huge differences, mm -hmm. but just a couple little differences here and there. With the, uh, the space, obviously it seems like that would be in colder climates. How, how are they as far as their hardiness to cold climates? And then I guess because they're in a, in like more of a hutch or a cage situation, it, it seems to me like it would be a little bit easier to insulate that if need be. But touch on that a little bit as far as like how the the sustainability and resiliency of them being in different climates, uh, you have to like shelter and, and wind and, and coolness and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Uh, now we have an aviary um, and we've had the quail in the aviary before and that works fine too. Uh, that's more of a natural environment. Mm -hmm. And so if you put them in there, they do just fine um, and they actually will go broody. Okay. Um, so them go, you know, usually you need to hatch the eggs that they lay. Mm -hmm. Um, but if they have more of a natural environment, uh, and they're on the ground, then, you know, they can go broody and hatch their own out. But we don't do that just because it's really hard to collect the eggs and they're so small and there's so many of them. There's no way we could do it. But you can, you can do a, hu a hutch or a cage or an aviary or whatever. Um, now the brooding process they, the first week, they're about a third of the size of a chicken. So they're very heat dependent the first week. After that, they're about three times the size. So week two, they're about the size of a chicken chick. So they grow extremely fast. Okay. Uh, you need heat for about three to four weeks, depending on where you live. Uh, you know, if you're in Florida or Texas, three weeks, throw them outside, you're good to go. Okay. You're, you know, up north probably wait an extra week. You're a lot colder there. But once they're, we'll say four weeks old or older, you throw them wherever you want to throw them. Either it's a garage, uninsulated, or a shed, or outdoors, aviary, hutch, whatever. They're good to go. The temperature really doesn't affect them. It's the weather that could affect them. So as long as they have a little area that they can get out of the elements, rain, snow, wind, uh, and they can get out of that, they do just fine. Uh, we have a ton of our customers that are uh, way up north or even Alaska, uh, Canada. And so we were actually in Canada last week and it was six degrees and they were in an uninsulated uh, garage, well, barn, yeah. shed kind of thing. Uh, all of them looked great. Okay. They looked completely happy. Um, so they kind of uh, adapt to their location as long as they're fully feathered. Yeah which is four weeks old or older. So like a traditional animal, you'd want to keep them out of, you know, like give them a, a place to get out of the elements as far as like staying dry. And then I'm sure like a black for them to stay out of the wind if they needed to get out of that. And then it sounds to me like, you know, as far as food and water goes, as long as you're keeping, 
uh, you know, non-frozen water in front of them that they can have access to just the basic care for any livestock that you'd have. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Same deal. Um, so like we raise rabbits as well. Those are just for us. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, we've got two cages of rabbits and they have the rabbit waters. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, during winter season, which it is now, we go out, we put the new ones on, bring them in, just thaw them out in the house. And then at night we switch them out and just keep doing that same same kind of deal. Okay. As long as they have food and water uh, and they have at least three quail per square foot and they have a little shelter, you're golden.